come now to chapter 2 of the Song of Solomon, and we just remind ourselves very briefly of what we spoke about last week of, first of all, what a strange book this is. Um, it's a book that focuses on the beauty and the power of romantic love and actually directly, I'm not saying indirectly, but directly it has very little to say about God or theology. Or that. Now indirectly it has a lot to say about God and theology. But um, it's just remarkable that a book like this is included within the scriptures. And there's so much for us to learn from it. So we're just going to drop down here into chapter 2, verse 1, and we're going to consider just through this chapter these different snapshots of a relationship between a young woman that we're calling the maiden and a young man that we're calling the beloved. The beloved was King Solomon. The maiden was uh, the Shulamite, uh, a young woman that he was very much in love in. And we remind ourselves of one other thing, that some of the... Um, power and the beauty of this book, it can actually discourage us. Because number one, if we're single, we think, well, I don't have that. You know, and it's discouraging. If you're married, you can say, well, I don't have that. We remind ourselves of something here, that this is an idealized picture of a relationship. It's like God's highest picture. It's the highest good. And not every relationship has this at all times. That's for sure. But we remind ourselves, not even Solomon had this. He's the one who wrote it. And we almost sense that maybe Solomon wrote this with the longing that this was the ideal that he had tasted so little of. Yet it was still important for him to understand it and to explain it to others. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 1. The maiden and her beloved are continuing to praise one another, and now the maiden is going to describe herself to her beloved. She says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Um, she has this interesting view of herself. She started out in chapter 1 of being very self-conscious, very unsure of her appearance. Now she says to her beloved, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Now the first thing we need to clear up here in our understanding is that in traditional hymns and Christian writing, Jesus is often referred to as the rose of Sharon. That is a misunderstanding of the Song of Solomon. It's pretty clear here in verse 1 that this is not the beloved who, in an allegorical understanding of the Song of Solomon, the beloved would represent Jesus. This is the maiden. If you want to take the allegory, this is the church saying to Jesus, I am the rose of Sharon, I am the lily of the valley. So it's just sort of this mistaken understanding or application of the allegory of this. But notice, if you want to consider it either from the maiden's perspective or in the allegorical sense from the church's perspective, it's pretty significant that she says, I am the rose of Sharon, I am the lily of the valley. Because ladies and gentlemen, the rose of Sharon and the lily of valleys were not spectacular flowers. They were flowers. And you can say every flower has its own beauty. We don't usually think of ugly flowers, do we? But let's face it, some flowers are more beautiful than others. Some flowers are just more eye-catching than others. And it seems, and commentators aren't united on this, but it seems that the majority opinion on this is that she's describing herself as a flower, but a humble one. I have a beauty. I'm a rose of Sharon. I'm a lily of the valley. By the way, those flowers, from what we can understand from the ancient Hebrew, they do not answer to what we think of as a rose or to what we think of as lily of the valley. These are different flowers than we would apply that terminology to. And, and I can get into, you know, the intricacies of it. But it really doesn't matter. The, the idea seems to be that these are simple flowers. I like what G. Campbell Morgan said about this. I think he hit it spot on. He said, thus the bride's description of herself was really self-deprecatory rather than otherwise. It was as if that she saw that there was nothing in her beauty extraordinary or out of the common. Do you get this idea here? She's just saying, yeah, I'm, I'm beautiful, but ordinary. I'm beautiful in a simple way. And, and by the way, I suppose 
Having never really been a woman, I can't really tell you, but I suppose there's a lot of women who feel that way. They, they may not think of themselves as ugly or, you know, hideous, but they, they just kind of know, yeah, you know what, there's a lot prettier people out there than me. If I'm a flower, I'm a simple one. If I'm a flower, I'm one of the run-of-the-mill wildflowers. I'm not that one that you're going to see in that stunning, gorgeous, knockout bouquet. I'm the, the, the handful of daisies from the roadside. So notice what the beloved responds to in verse 2. He says, like a lily among the thorns, so is my love among the daughters. I think this is just sort of interesting and brilliant all at the same time. The beloved, the man in response, he doesn't try to say, oh, no, 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 you're not a simple flower. You're a gorgeous, you're an orchid, you're whatever great flowers. I don't even know what good flowers are, but you, you can, you're not some spectacular flower. He doesn't try to persuade her of that. No, what does he say? Oh, no, no, you're a lily. Okay, great, you're a lily. But you know what you are? Look at the phrase he says there in verse 2. Like a lily among the thorns. You see, whatever the maiden might feel about her own beauty, the beloved knew that she was beautiful. And he spoke to her as a beautiful woman. And he said, listen, you may be a simple flower, but you know what? You are among thorns. In other words, compared to the other ones around you, look at you. All the other ones around, they're not flowers at all. They're just thorns. Thorns are unwelcoming. It's as if he looks at her and he says, you may think of yourself as simple and not so spectacular, but you know what I see among you? I see someone special and I only have my eye on you. Everybody else is like a sharp thorn to me, but you, you're like a flower. This introduces a thought that is so significant and so powerful in the dynamic of a relationship between a man and a woman how important it is for the man to communicate to the woman that she is preferred in his eyes. You're the one for me. Look, objectively, I can look at my wife and say she's not perfect. I can think of flaws. I can think of weaknesses. I can think of failing. I can think of that objectively. But I'll tell you one thing I know. She's perfect for me. And so for me, she's perfect. Everybody else is a thorn. She's a lily. And it's important that she feel that way. That ability to communicate that to a woman, and if the maiden can be persuaded of that by her beloved, what a peace it brings into her life. It's like, yeah, you're a lily surrounded by a bunch of spectacular flowers, and my eyes are always looking at them. No, 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 you're a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Now in verse 3, the maiden is just going to enjoy the loving presence of her beloved. He, she's going to compliment him right back. She says, like an apple tree among the trees of wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. You know, the language of trees and plants, it continues on. Now with the maiden describing the beloved like being a large, healthy, life-giving apple tree. Now, again, it would seem that what we think of as an apple tree probably isn't what she's referring to, but some just kind of beautiful, fruitful tree. And you can sense that the couple's now in that beautiful stage where, where they're busy complimenting each other. You, I'm a simple wildflower, she says. No, you're like a wildflower among the thrones. Well, you're like a beautiful apple tree, and then go forth, and so on, so on. What a beautiful thing for a couple to compete with, isn't it? to compete in complimenting one another. And then she says something very beautiful, very endearing in verse 3. She says, I sat down in his shade with great delight. She says, in your presence, I find a sense of security and peace under your protective covering. Under your shade, I can sit down and relax. I am no longer at the mercy of other people I am under your shade. I am under your care. And I want you to make a connection. She felt this security of being under his protective care when he proclaimed his preference for her. That, that's one of the things that gives a woman a great amount of security. Men, do you think a big bank account is going to give your wife security? Well, I mean, look, it might help. But not if she knows that at any minute you might take half of that bank account and split up. What good is that? 
But if she knows you prefer her above everything else, that'll give her a sense of security that nothing else can really match. And it just answers this ache that comes into the mind of a woman from time to time, and sometimes it sort of torments them. Does he really still prefer me? Does he really value me above everybody else? Would he leave me if he could? The responsible, wise, loving husband does everything he can to pour out his heart to his wife and assure her, baby, it's you and me forever. You are my lily among the thorns. And then she'll find shade and peace and security in his presence. Now, beginning uh, with the next verse, verse 3, excuse me, verse 4, it begins a section to the end of the chapter where the maiden, in either a dream or a daydream, is thinking about the love that they share and that they will share. I told you before that we can't really assign a strict chronology to the book of Song of Solomons. It's snapshots taken from here and there. However, it does seem that in this early part of the book, this is before their marriage and before their marriage is consummated. That's later on in chapter 4. So what she's talking about here is she will refer to aspects of the consummation of their marriage... By consummation, I mean sexually. But she's doing it in a dream. She's dreaming about what is to come. And by the way, that, that's sort of characteristic of somebody who's deeply in love, isn't it? I mean, they're dreaming about the future and about how things will be. The dialogue from verse 4 down to verse 17, the rest of the chapter we're going to look at together tonight, the dialogue seems to completely belong to the maiden. And where she talks about the beloved doing or saying something, he's saying it in her dream. So what we have here is a dream sequence. She's dreaming about her future from verse 4 to the end of the chapter. Verse 4. He brought me into his banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with cakes of raisins. Refresh me with apples, for I am lovesick. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. Now consider just these first few verses in the sort of dream sequence that the maiden has. She dreamily thinks of her beloved bringing her to a special place. He brought me to the banqueting house. More literally, it's a house of wine. It probably has in mind some outdoor place that's something like a gazebo where they would store wine and have feasts. That's probably the idea that it was in the ancient world. She's dreamily thinking, he took me to this outdoor place, this house of wine, this banqueting house. It's a secluded, outdoorsy place where the maiden and her beloved could be together and eventually intimate. Although right now it's just in her dream. She's dreaming about this. And what does he say? Verse 4, she says, rather, his banner over me was love. And if you take that literally, it's a strange expression. Do you see the beloved running around with a flag, you know? Woo, here's my banner. No, but what what is it saying? Poetically, she's speaking, and in her dream, he's saying, it's like he put a great big sign over me saying, I love you. I choose you. He proclaimed his love and wanted everybody to know it. She's mine. I'm hers. We belong together. His banner over me was love. He's proclaiming his love so beautifully, so powerfully, it's as if he put up a great big sign or banner or flag to say it. It's as if there's no hiding the love that he has for her. She says in reply, there, verse 5, sustain me with cakes of raisins, refresh me with apples. They they thought of enjoying food with her beloved in their outdoor rendezvous. Now, I I should have you know that some commentators associate these food items, cakes of raisins, apples, with pagan fertility rites or even aphrodisiac qualities. I've looked into these kind of things. I don't think that's what the reference to is at all. 
This is just simple outdoorsy, sweet, pleasant food. In our thing, we, we, had, uh, we, we had chocolates and whatever. You know, we just, we, we had a wonderful time. I think that's just basically the idea. But then she pours out her heart in verse five. Do you see that? She says, I am lovesick. What a great phrase, isn't it? The, the maiden described having a feeling that's familiar to many of us who have known the thrill of romantic love. There's something about that, isn't it? She felt physically weak and perhaps even a little bit disoriented because of the strength of attraction and infatuation that she felt towards her beloved. Now, I don't know. I don't want to get too personal right here for you. I'm not going to ask for any testimonies. <laughs> but have you felt that? Have you felt what that's like? You get a little goofy in the head, a little weak in the knees. It's like, wow, I'm, I'm so struck by this person, and I'm so in love. I feel this flood of affection and infatuation. I'm lovesick. You know, we've heard this falling in love, falling head over heels, but there's something to it. You can't get that person out of your mind. You think about it, it's so special. It's a, you, you get just like this, this wonderful, great feeling inside. Now, I could speak to married couples and say, listen, I remember that feeling about 200 years ago in my life. <laughs> but this is what I want you to understand. You, you had it at the beginning, didn't you? It's like, yes. I know what that's like. I felt that. I heard some of the most interesting teaching that I think I've ever heard on this subject by a man that's known to many of you right here in Santa Barbara, Dr. Jeffrey Schloss. And according to Dr. Schloss, there's a brain hormone that communicates the feeling of being in love or being infatuated. There's a hormone that causes that feeling. And one of the neurotransmitters is known as phenethylmanine. I, I know I'm mispronouncing that, but you could look it up in my notes. When that agent floods our brain, we are falling in love. By the way, that a neurotransmitter is also in fairly high quantities in chocolate. That chemical gives a feeling of exhilaration and thrill and well-being. And in high amounts, it can lead to a loss of appetite. This is what many people feel when they feel head over their heels in love. This chemical in the brain, it works something like in a cycle, at least in a relationship. At the beginning of the relationship, it spikes up, but then after four or five years, it begins to decline. By the way, according to Dr. Schloss, when you take a look at cultures around the world, there's a noticeable increase in rates of divorce at about four and a half years of marriage. And biologically speaking, it correlates with the decline of this neurotransmitter in the mind that gives a feeling of thrill and well-being. Now, this leads some scientists to say that we are made for monogamy in the sense that we're to have one partner at a time, but then change partners every four or five years. Well, we're really, I mean, if you were taking a look from a purely, a coldly scientific sense, okay, well, the neurotransmitter goes up and then when it declines, get a new partner and have the spike go up again. You, you could see where a scientist might say that, but that is taking a look at the data very narrowly. Dr. Schloss says that we know this is not true because in the brain, there are also completely different pathways with completely different chemical communicators. And these begin to form at about the four or five year period in the relationship. And they contribute to different feelings inside the human being. Instead of feelings of thrill, and I'm lovesick, and I can't eat, these are feelings of deep contentment and gratitude. One of the feelings, well, excuse me, one of the chemicals that mediates these feelings is oxycotton, which is the same chemical that is, excuse me, oxytoxin, which is this, it's similar to, to oxycotton, but the same chemical that's related to the bonding 
of a mother together with her infant. You see, the best research indicates that biologically speaking, relationships have two major phases. There's the attraction phase and there's the attachment phase. The attraction phase is very powerful. And it's the kind of condition that makes the maiden say, I am lovesick. And if you've experienced, you know exactly what it's speaking about. But the key to long-term relationships is sticking with it through the attraction phase into the attachment phase. There are some counselors who devote almost their entire practice to trying to help what they call love junkies. People who are addicted to those neurotransmitters that give the thrill. And they're so addicted that they just bounce from relationship to relationship. But they're utterly despairing and empty because they never really come in to the fulfillment of the attachment phase and a long-lasting relationship. You could say that we as human beings, God engineered us for the attachment phase. And he intended that the attraction phase be the gateway into it and not something into itself. Now, Dr. Schloss also says is that the good news is that when the relationship moves into the attachment phase, the attraction phase will recycle. And long-term married couples often experience the sense of falling in love all over again several times through their marriage. Now, when you take all this into consideration, this is why it is sometimes or maybe even often unwise to rush into a relationship when it's still in the I am lovesick attraction phase. That's not enough. You need to make sure it can last beyond that as well. I like what the old commentator Adam Clark said about this. He said of the lovesick person, While we admit such a person's sincerity, who can help questioning his judgment? Indeed, it's true, isn't it? There have been many errors of judgment made in that attraction phase. But there's no doubt that our maiden in her dream is in bliss. Now notice what she says going on here. In her dream, verse 6, she says... His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. She is dreamily imagining herself and her beloved lying together, and that the beloved is caressing her with his right hand, probably intimately. What we would call in an older generation, petting. The idea of just being very intimate with his hand contact with the woman, with his left hand under her head, and her right hand giving intimate caresses. That that phrase that's used there, embraces me, his right hand embraces me in verse 6, the word isn't used often in the Old Testament, and it's used in a variety of ways. Sometimes it's used for just a friendly greeting. When Joseph greeted his brothers in Genesis 48, it said he embraced them. There was nothing sexual in it, but, but it's also used, for example, in Proverbs chapter 5, in a very sexual sense. So it doesn't demand that the embrace be sexual, but the context suggests that it is. She's enraptured in her love, and she invites her beloved to enjoy her sexually. Now, since this is describing a dream or a daydream, she's describing the desire and not the action. The the, um, Revised Standard Version probably has it right here. It says in the RSV, oh, that his left hand were under my head and that his right hand embraced me. Because this is sort of a dream sequence. She's thinking about what's to come and it's just going to describe it later on happening. But here she's just dreaming about it. Notice what she says in verse 7. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem. Now, the exhortation to the daughters of Jerusalem in verse 7, it shows that this is a dream sequence. Because the daughters of Jerusalem are sort of like a chorus that watches the action. And if she's being intimate with her beloved, there's not a chorus of daughters of Jerusalem watching the action. So again, it's just a dream sequence. And and so she speaks to them. 
And what does she say? She, she commands him to vow by the gazelles or the does of the field, some kind of way of making an oath. She says, verse 7, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. Look at that phrase. Do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. Now, there's two meanings of that phrase in general. It could mean don't interrupt the sweet dream of love that the maiden enjoys. Don't draw her back to the reality of daily life. You ever been in a dream and you didn't want to wake up from it? It was so nice. That's how she feels. It could be that. But more likely, it could be don't start the process of a loving exchange until the opportunity and the appropriate occasions are present. Don't start something unless we can complete it. Now, friends, I think that's the greater meaning of that here. And you're going to see this phrase used a few times in the Song of Solomon. That simple phrase, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. Don't start something until it can be appropriately consummated. It's a very plain and powerful meaning there. The maiden wants none of the onlookers to hinder or interrupt their love until it's fulfilled and consummated. Don't interrupt it. Now, in terms of relationship, this is very important. In terms of relationship, she's saying, let our love progress and grow until it's mature and fruitful. Let us have a genuinely pleasing relationship. Don't let us go too fast. This is an important thing for relationships to hear. Now, one of the things that's very difficult, and we know this from a pastoral perspective, or, or I do, and those who do ministry here at the church know, And from a pastoral perspective, you have couples that want to get married, and one of the things you think is, well, let's not go into this too fast. The honest difficulty with that is, is that too fast is a fairly subjective judgment. There's some couples where it's like, come on, get married already. What are you waiting for? There's other couples like, whoa, slow down a little bit. It takes some pastoral discretion and wisdom to be able to speak into each situation. But you see, The strong desire to express their love physically is there, but she says, don't awaken it until it can be consummated in a godly way. You know, it's sort of like letting a flower grow until it very naturally blooms instead of trying to make the flower grow and blossom. She's saying, don't get it started until it be consummated in an appropriate way. This isn't repression you know what repression is repression is the rejection and the denial of feelings often in a sense of shame don't you feel that way put away those desires put away those longings no we're not trying to repress things and cover them with tape. no no we're not into repression but there is a godly sense of suppression where it's the conscious restraint of natural impulses and feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, if you cannot suppress your romantic and sexual feelings, you're going to be in a lot of trouble in life. This is one of the most important things that a couple communicates to one another before marriage. Many couples who are destined for marriage, maybe they're engaged, maybe they know they're going to be engaged, they they honestly think, what's the harm if we have sex with one another? What's the harm? Why not? It'll still just be us. What's the harm? No, I tell you, there is value, you man and you woman, in suppressing yourself, and not repression, but suppression. And let me tell you, one of the great values of it is, is you are communicating so powerfully to your spouse This belongs only in marriage. Isn't that what you want your spouse to think of you when you are married? I have the self-control to keep this in marriage. When you go outside the marriage bonds, even if you're engaged, do you realize what you're saying to your future spouse? 
You're saying to your future spouse, I'm willing to have sex outside the marital bond. Is that really what you want to communicate to your future spouse? How much wiser it is to say, don't stir up love until it awakens. Don't bother it until it can take its natural course and righteously be fulfilled. Now, that's what it means in terms of relationship. In terms of passion, you could see this as a passionate statement. Don't stir up or awaken love until it pleases. It's as if she's saying in terms of passion, let our lovemaking continue without interruption until we're both fulfilled. Don't let us get started until we can finish. And it's just sort of a very, you know, passionate statement. I don't want to get it started unless we can consummate together. So it's a very insightful statement that she has even in her dream. Now, starting at verse 8, the maiden is going to very happily think over a visit from her beloved. It's like the scene shifts in her dream. And dreams are sometimes like that, shifting from one scene to another. Here we go, another scene in the dream. The voice of my beloved, verse 8, behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He's looking through the windows, gazing through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth her green figs and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face and let me hear your voice for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Here in verse 8, the the maiden is moved to this other scene and she hears the voice of her beloved. It's a visit from my beloved, my boyfriend, my fiancé, the one that I will be spouse with later because the marriage is consummated later in the book of Song of Solomon. He's come for a visit. And behold, verse 8, he comes leaping upon the mountains. You, You know, she's using this poetic figure, skipping and leaping. You know, he's like a bouncing deer. Look how strong and just how, how virile he is. He stands behind the wall. He's looking through the windows. He wants to see if I'm home. And then this is what he says, verse 10. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. The maiden thinks of her beloved inviting her to come out and enjoy the glory of spring with the rain over and gone and with the beautiful flowers outside and singing. He's come to my house. He's, baby, let's go for a walk. It's beautiful outside. The birds are singing. The sun is shining. Let's take a hike through the wilderness. Let's take a hike through nature because it's beautiful outside and I want to enjoy it with you. That's why he says in verse 13, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. I'll tell you what's really insightful about this. The maiden is dreaming of the beloved saying this. And women often, and I'll say often, because look, not every woman's alike, but women often have this great desire to just want to feel pursued. That the husband would come along and say, baby, I want to spend some time with you today. Let's go out and do something together. Let's go out and take a hike. Let's go enjoy nature. Let's go out and just simply rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. The maiden dreamt of her beloved insisting that they joy the beauty of spring together. It was important for her to know that he really wanted to do this with her and that she didn't do it, he didn't do it reluctantly. As if he's like, all right, it's date night. Do you want to do something? You know, what a drag that is, isn't it? There's something that really resonates powerfully in the heart of a woman when she knows, she has a sense, he wants to be with me. He wants to spend some time with me. I'm not a burden or a hassle to him. I'm not some great inconvenience. It's not like, okay, you know, nothing else is on. Dodger game's over. 
you know, uh, nothing else is going on, nothing I got to do, no more hobbies I can keep myself busy with. All right, well, what's happening with the old lady? <laughs> that, that doesn't cherish, no maiden dreams of that. But they dream of this, of just wanting to be with her. And then the maiden imagined these sweet, impassioned words from her beloved. Look at it in verse 14. Oh, my love, my dove, I should say, let me see your face. He'd seek her out and and he'd embrace her as someone lovely and beautiful. And then she says in response, look at this. No wonder she says this, verse 14, for your voice is sweet. The maiden considered how sweet and meaningful her beloved's voice was. You know, the human voice is an amazing instrument. The amusing voice, excuse me, The human voice has an amazing ability to communicate and to connect. The the voice, let me read you a quote from a woman named uh, uh, Anne Karpf, who wrote a book called The Human Voice. She said, the voice can invite or discourage intimacy without ever having to be verbally explicit or even conscious of what it is doing. We use our voices to repel and to attract, to encourage or to undermine. As animals with smell, so are humans with the voice. And it's really true. God has given the human voice and the human ear a remarkable ability to communicate. And she says of her beloved's voice, it is so sweet and with all the power that's wrapped up in the human voice no wonder she says that now verse 15 is a little bit hard to understand we seem to still be in the maiden's dream but in the grammar of this it seems like maybe this is being said by the maiden's brothers we don't exactly know but verse 15 says Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. It's as if they hear this cried out from the side. (laughs) You know, maybe the idea is they're walking through nature, and and these guys, the the maiden's brothers, walk by. And this is where they say, hey, guys, remember, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Now, I want you to notice something. The idea that commentators have seen in this throughout the centuries is that the idea is that the little foxes that spoil the vines, these are little things that disrupt a relationship. And isn't it true that many times vines are spoiled by little foxes? Doesn't have to be a great big hurricane. Doesn't have to be, you know, an elephant that goes through the vineyard. The little foxes, the little things, can eat up and spoil a relationship. One commentator listed several things that trouble many couples that he considered to be little foxes. He said, when there's uncontrolled desire that drives a wedge of guilt and mistrust between the couple, that's like a little fox. He said, mistrust and jealousy that strain and break the bond of love, that's a little fox. When there's selfishness and pride that refuses to acknowledge wrong and fault to one another, that's a little fox that's spoiling the vine. When there's an unforgiving attitude that will not accept an apology, that's a little fox that spoils the vine. And, and we're encouraged in this sense of relation. Look for, the, look for those little foxes. Drive them out. By the way, if you notice what it says there, it says, catch us, the little foxes. The, the, the maiden doesn't say to the beloved, you catch them. Or the beloved doesn't say to the maiden, you catch them. How do those little foxes caught and conquered? Together. Catch us, the little foxes. It's a cooperative work. If your marriage, if your relationship is going to get better, it's not going to come by finger pointing. Yeah, it'll get better when they get their act together. No, it's got to be done together or it'll never happen at all. For our vines have tender grapes. The the relationship is both specially precious. Tender grapes are the best. But it's also specially vulnerable. It needs protection. Tender grapes need to be guarded. Now, In verses 16 and 17, the maiden is going to think about her beloved, and we'll end with these two verses. By the way, verses 16 and 17, Charles Spurgeon preached eight sermons on these two verses alone. Wow. Now, he he took it almost all from the allegorical end. He didn't think it was applying very much to marriage. This was Victorian England, of course, at the time. He's taking it as an allegory between the believer's relationship with Jesus, and there's something for us to learn from that. 
But the main point is the human romantic relationship. What do verses 16 and 17 say? My beloved is mine and I am his. He feeds his flock among the lilies until the day breaks and the shadows flee away. Turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag among, among, upon the mountains of Bethel. Friends, sometimes I can't get over that line in verse 16. I, I, I think sometimes I'm just going to have to preach a whole sermon just on that one line. I am my beloved, and he is mine. What a powerful thing, both in our human relationship, but also our relationship with God. You see, the maiden concludes this dreamy section very confident in the bond that joins together her and her beloved. He belongs to her, and she belongs to him. In this sense, they are one. They're joined together with mutual bonds of affection and not one partner clinging desperately to another reluctant partner. You know relationships like that. You've either been in them or you've seen them. They're not one. You, you got one reluctant one and one clinging one. This is the furthest thing from that. This is a mutuality of love and oneness. I'm my beloved's and he is mine. It's also a statement of exclusivity and preference. They are not saying my beloved is mine and I belong to him and a few other guys. Nor are they saying I am my beloved and he is mine and I also belong to 999 other women as Solomon would later have to say if he was writing truthfully. No, you see, many people think that the key to finding love and a happy marriage is finding the perfect person. But ladies and gentlemen, it's more a matter of finding the person that belongs to you and that you belong to them. Are you looking for that perfect person? You'll never find him. Now, of course, you know that intellectually. You can tell yourself that, you know. All right, there's no perfect people out there. I'm not perfect. I'm not looking for the perfect person. But really, what you need to look for, you need to look for a person who says, I belong to you, and you can belong to me, and together we can be one. That's what she found with her beloved. Now, I can't get over how this speaks also of our relationship with Jesus. I am so happy that I can look to my Savior in heaven and say, I am my beloved's and he is mine. I belong to him and he belongs to me. Spurgeon developed this beautifully. He talked about ways that I belong to Jesus, ways that I am my beloved's. He said, I am his by the gift of the Father. I am his by purchase. He paid his own life for me. I am his by conquest. He fought for me and won. I'm his by surrender because I gave himself to me. No, I belong to him. There's no doubt about that. But then Spurgeon also considers ways that he belongs to me. He is mine because we're connected to the same body. He's the head and I'm part of the body. That's what he says. He is mine by affectionate relationship. He has given me his love and therefore we belong together. He is mine by the connection of birth. I'm born again by him, so we're connected. He's mine by choice. He gave himself for me. I didn't just choose for him, but before I ever chose for him, he chose for me. He gave himself for me. He's mine by indwelling. He's decided to live inside me, and he is mine personally. He's mine eternally. Friends, I don't know about you, but I can just let that thought roll over in my mind again and again and again, both in terms of my loving wife, where I would want her to be able to say, I am my beloved's and he is mine. But I think about it too in my relationship with Jesus. I am my beloved's 
and he is mine. We belong together. You know, I, I say it often in jest uh, when I go places. Like when I go to a conference. Uh, maybe I'll go to a conference someplace here in the States or maybe if I have the opportunity internationally. And many times Ingalil is able to go to one of these conferences with me and that's great. But, but oftentimes she's not able to go with me for if she has some obligation at home. But let me tell you, I often joke about this with people, but it's true. When I show up at a conference or at a church or something like that without Ingalil, what do you think the first question is that people ask? Do they say, hey, David, great to see you. How's it going? Do they say that first? No way. You know what they say? They say, hi, David, where's Ingalil? Now, I understand it perfectly. Because if you know Ingalil and you know me, she's a much more pleasant person than I am. I mean, <laughs> if, if, you, if you'd want to be around either one of us, you'd want to be around her and not around me. It makes perfect sense. But do you see, there's something in me that delights in that. I love it when people think of us as together. I love it that anytime somebody sees me, they say, well, where's Ingalil? Shouldn't she be around? David's here. Where's Ingalil? I'm like, yeah, that's right. I am my beloved, and he is mine. I want it to be that way in my relationship with Jesus as well. Friends, what a beautiful thing we have. The maiden's dream, she cries out to her beloved, verse 17, turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag. She dreams of her beloved full of energy, full of masculinity, like a strong young gazelle or stag. She kind of leaves the dream sequence here, and we'll pick it up the next time we're together here in the Song of Solomon. Look, let me conclude with this. I hope that you can say it in your married relationship, if you are married. If you're not married or you're not married yet, I pray God's preparing you for that, to really be able to have that kind of relationship with another person where you can say, I am my beloved's and he is mine. But I pray that each and every one of you would know what it's like to have the beauty of that relationship with Jesus Christ, your Lord where you are one with him. Because you know what? He intended, and many of you know this, he intended that the oneness of the marriage relationship be an illustration of the oneness that he has with his people. Do you see where they're connected? He wants the same values and principles to dominate in both. So Lord, prepare us to be made one with the spouse that may be in our future. Make us one with the spouse you've given us now for those who are married. But Lord, in particular, we pray that you would, by your presence and by your power, that you would, Lord, help us to truly know our oneness in relationship to you. I am my beloved and he is mine. His banner over me is love. Thank you for that, Lord. We praise you together tonight for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.